Hi, and welcome back to another Toothpickings web interview. I'm Brian. I blog as Toothpickings, and I do web interviews from a location that is a safe social distance from you and my interviewees and anybody else. That's the only way I can figure out to keep myself healthy during this current pandemic. Speaking of pandemics and endemics, the guest today... Michael Bell. I wanted to talk to this guy for a long time. He wrote Food for the Dead. He's got a new book coming out called The Vampire's Grasp. This is a guy who got me started in my interest in vampires, unbeknownst to him, uh, by writing books about folklore and nonfiction. I said endemic a moment ago because an endemic in the form of tuberculosis or consumption, if you will, has a big role to play when it comes to the sustained American vampire panic. What's the American vampire panic? You know about the witch hunts. You know about the witch trials. Those didn't last very long. What did last for over 100 years was the American vampire panic. It was a sustained fear of the dead coming back to cause more death. Now, the people doing this practice, they never used the word vampire. But we all understand that it was a mirror image. It was almost a DNA match for the folks in Eastern Europe who did believe in vampires and called them vampires uh, for the practices that they were undertaking to try to protect themselves from the undead. Same thing was happening in New England. And they didn't use the word vampire, but they were practicing the same remedies. So we can debate, and Michael Bell will help us debate, what that means and where the line between vampire and spirit or demon might be. But we're going to, for now, cast a wide net and say vampire. I hope you enjoyed this interview with Michael Bell. Please let me know what you think down below, and check out some of the links to Michael Bell's work and his upcoming work. Dr. Michael Bell, thank you so much for joining us here today. Uh, it's my pleasure. Uh, I'm a big fan of your book, Food for the Dead, and I'm looking forward to your next one. Uh, when I first got interested in vampires, in fact, Food for the Dead was one of the early books I read, and it uh, I think it kind of helped me see all of the vampire world through the lens of folklore, more so than through the lens of uh, movies or books or, or, or fiction, yeah. I think, which I think is where a lot of people come at it from. Yeah, I agree. I, I'm really pleased that, that you liked it and that the folklore perspective is is uh, good for you. I think it's good for everyone, actually, to to see where these things come from. I, I don't know. I think I have a, uh, maybe me, I have a bias towards origination. So it's like, well, what, was, what came first? Mm -hmm. You know, and even when thinking about movie vampires, I think, well, who was the first movie vampire? Well, how did we get to movie vampires? What came first? The literary vampires and what inspired that? And then we get back to the folklore. Right. And so I guess uh, a question I would have for you right off the bat would be, how does an American folkloric vampire look different than what we might be used to if we've only seen movies or read books about vampires? Well, unfortunately, it would look like a, a dead corpse that was... Perhaps not totally decomposed, but in the way, in the in the process of uh, decomposing. So not very romantic. Not a not a guy in a tuxedo or a nice looking woman with sharp fangs. Are are people disappointed when they find that out? Sure. I think it's difficult because I think once we get a stereotypic typical image imprinted in our in our brains. It's very difficult to uh, to get rid of it. Have you seen any vampires uh, represented in popular media where you're like, hey, that's not too far off. That might be the closest representation. Uh, not really, because I think invariably the vampires of popular culture or literature, um, they have to be revenants. Mm -hmm. They have to actually come out of the grave, corporeal, you know, in a material form. Now, sometimes they'll do that in another form, like a butterfly or a, or a bat, in the case of you know, Dracula. But then they they sh uh, they uh, shapeshift back into their uh, vampire form, their human-looking form. Um, but that's not what happens in, in New England at all. 
That this is important because the New England vampires somehow were affecting events while their bodies stayed in the graves. Is that right? Correct. Correct. And in fact, the body that was in the grave wasn't really the vampire. Some evil spirit, at least this is the, the theory that as far as anybody had articulated it you know, in the communities, it was some sort of an evil spirit that had inhabited the corpse of one of your relatives. So it wasn't like, say, Mercy Brown, the last vampire. It wasn't her, per se, who was a vampire. It was something had gotten into her heart, her lungs, her liver, one of her vital organs, or several of them, and was keeping itself alive by drawing out the, the, the uh, life, the blood, from living family members. And that's why they were looking for fresh blood in the heart when he exhumed these so-called vampires. Well, and to that end, they, they weren't too far off the mark for people who didn't understand the germ theory, right? Right. Yeah, I mean, sure. In a sense, when, when you look at the vampire belief, it's like death itself was contagious. So you had to purify the dead to keep that contagion from spreading into the rest of the family. Well, let's talk about that. Uh, you you use the word uh, necrophobia in some of your writing, uh, which, if I if I understand right, is fear of the dead and a fear that death causes more death, or that <clears throat> the dead cause death. Is that correct? Yeah. Is that? It seems to me like that just seems to be something that is instinctual in people. I think so, and that's why. In a sense, the vampire belief is, is very logical. It's reasonable. Now, it may not be rational in terms of scientific rationality and empirical science, but in terms of uh, the folk logic involved, it's reasonable. If you've ever been around small children, I've, I've noticed that they'll walk through a cemetery, and the moment they understand that there are dead people under the ground, it'll mm -hmm. freak them out. <laughs> So I, I don't think this is something we're even taught. I think that this is just something we kind of, we have. Yeah. Somehow. Yeah. I can't argue with that. I think there's so many, uh, so many things in our, in our DNA that we can't really explain. There's a, there's a line you wrote, uh, and it goes like this. I'm quote you to you, which I, I don't know if that's flattering or if that's uh, awkward <laughs> for you, but. I mean, even remember I wrote it so uh, blaming the dead for death seems but a short logical step from the fundamental vampire concept that the dead have a life after death mm -hmm. so if we think that if I'm if I'm understanding you right if we think that the dead can cause more death mm -hmm. then it doesn't take a whole lot more to start thinking that maybe some of these folks have some sort of vampire qualities where they can uh, consciously affect us from beyond the grave. Yes. Well, where in many religions and belief systems, uh, you know, you don't, once you die, your mortal self dies, there's a, something left from of you that continues on in another form, in another realm, perhaps. Uh, you know, we call it the soul. And Ideally, when you die, your soul goes where it's supposed to go and, and is at peace. Mm -hmm. But if something happens, if there's a glitch, something goes wrong, and your soul does not go where it's supposed to go, then it can remain here in different forms or in different ways and cause trouble for the living. And so in the vampire belief system in, in Europe, northern and eastern Europe, you know, it's a pretty la elaborate cultural system that relatives have to do all the things they're supposed to do uh, to somebody when it's when the person's alive. Now, if you slighted someone, you know, it could be that person then after death will not want to depart, will want to stay, or will have to stay to get, I guess you would say, to make uh, to even the score. 
So that's why it's it's sort of a social sanctioning of doing the right things, performing the the right rituals, uh, making sure your social relationships are on uh, you know in in a, on a par or a balance the way they're supposed to be, that you've fulfilled your obligations and not just accepted somebody's obligation to you, but you have a response a mutual responsibility. So in a sense, it's a, a sanctioning system, the vampire belief system, at least in, in the parts of Europe. I remember reading uh, something that Mary Halab had written about. Uh, in, in some places, the vampire was kind of used as a threat by the older folks to say, you better take care of me sure. when I'm old or when I die. You better take care of my remains properly or else I might come back. Sure. Right. So it's not just social obligations while you're alive, but it's also after you, after you're deceased, you know, you, you can't do anything about it apparently because you're dead. So this is a way to enforce the proper funeral rites too, to make sure the kind of respect that should be given to someone in that culture when, when they pass away, that it's done properly. The funeral's done right. But was you know, was that a factor in the New England as much? No, not at all, actually. So that's and that's where it gets more interesting because in New England, I, th I think it came here basically as a folk medical practice. Mm -hmm. So all of that stuff, all of that cultural and social, you might say, baggage that comes with the vampire, didn't come here with the practice, with the ritual. So I think the ritual was brought here, I'm thinking by uh, some traveling doctors from Europe who would come into the East Coast and then travel around selling their cures or whatever they were. And this was probably one of them that was brought. Because the very first case we have in 1784 that I know of anyway, from Willington, Connecticut, a man who's a town official writes a letter to the local newspaper complaining about a foreign quack doctor who was telling people that they could cure consumption if they would follow his advice. And one of the, one of the men in the town, a friend of the guy who wrote the letter actually, did exhume two of his children's bodies. And he was supposed to look for a vine that was growing through the, through the breast of the of a corpse and then take out the heart and burn it and so on. So I think that's how it came here. Now, if a foreign practitioner who's brought that practice to New England from somewhere in Europe uh, is selling a cure, he's not selling an entire cultural system. So he, he, didn't, he didn't say, well, you know, this is a result of you not doing the things you're supposed to do that didn't have anything to do with it. And the people that he was selling it to, or giving it to, were interested in curing, you know, stopping the disease from decimating their families. And so they weren't really interested in, in all that cultural baggage either. I mean, it was kind of the Yankee attitude is just, don't bother me with all that stuff there. You just tell me what I have to do to get rid of it. Just give me what works. It. Yeah. That's right. The bottom line. Don't need to know the theory. I can't help but uh, be reminded of uh, a, a few quack notions that have come up in very recent memory to cure our current pandemic. That's true. Yeah, you, you can go to Snopes, <laughs> you know, <laughs> the vetting, uh, sure. the vetting website, and you can look up, you know, look at COVID nineteen or coronavirus, and you'll see all these things that are spreading. And in fact, a fellow folklorist just wrote a nice little essay and published it online for the Smithsonian uh, about some of the recent folklore that we have now coming out around COVID-19. You know, how to avoid it, how to cure yourself, everything from like putting a vacuum cleaner down your throat no. <laughs> or a hair dryer. Mm -hmm. Okay, because yeah, the, the heat from the hair dryer would be too yeah. much. Yeah. Um, I mean, when you have public officials advocating this kind of stuff too, then you know you know we're going, we're a little bit in in uh, bizarre territory. That 
that, and, and, that makes... and and people take that advice sometimes and try those things. So it's it's hard to criticize the people of the 1700s and 1800s too much for trying these kind of what seem like gruesome, wacky practices. Right. Well, yeah, I think I think somewhere I, I wrote that let's not break our arms, patting ourselves on the back over how smart we are today. I mean, we have more knowledge than we had in the past. We're not any smarter. Mm -hmm. We haven't evolved that way. Our IQs are basically probably the same. We still have the same reasoning ability. We just have more data, more information, more science that helps us. But what happens when science doesn't give you the answer or an answer that works? And then you're facing uh, disease, Mm -hmm. perhaps death. You know, the uncertainty and the fear drives people to adopt any potential remedy, you know, whether it's scientifically based or if it's just some sort of whimsical thing. How, how bad do you think uh, our current pandemic would have to get before we started doing things like digging up bodies? Well, I, you know, people are doing crazy things, and there, there are a lot of uh, unscrupulous practitioners who are or contacting uh, contacting uh, people, sending out ads. You know that someone was, is uh, selling uh, a, a healing oil. You know mm-hmm. this will this will prevent you from getting this will prevent the COVID nineteen if you take this you know this magical oil that they're selling. So the quack doctors, the snake oil salesmen, are still around. They've just uh, adopted different tactics and strategies and, and, you know, a more modern approach, I guess, but it's still snake oil, snake oil. Absolutely. I feel like we, we, we jumped past some of the meat of it and went right to the conclusion uh, <laughs> of, of all of this. But uh, maybe we should back up a little bit. Can you tell me a little bit about what happened in these communities when people had decided that there was a vampire in their midst? What did they do? Okay. Okay, well, number one, they weren't using that term. Good point, vampire. yes. So, yeah, I, I use the term just because it's, it's understandable. And I, I do think this is the, a, very, a, a localized variant of a, a wider tradition of vampirism. Uh, that they just didn't call it that. Outsiders did occasionally. And that didn't even start until I think about 1848. The first time somebody from the outside labeled it vampirism, and it had been going on since like 18, 1784. So it took but, a while for anybody to like call it that. But like you said, that their their solution to the problem was so similar to the solution in Eastern Europe. Yes, it, it, I think you're you're right to use the term. Yeah, just just for clarity, if nothing else. Right. That's debatable. So, you know, people who are vampirologists or study vampires, we don't agree on on the terminology or where you draw the line. You know, there's splitters and there are lumpers. I tend to be a lumper. I see the broad categories of things, and I don't make the fine distinctions. But, oh, well, that's, that's a different kind of beast. It's not exactly a vampire. So but they were basically un, unnamed. It was an unnamed thing in, in New England. What did they think the unnamed thing was doing to them? It was killing them one at a time, the family. One person would get sick, die. Another person would get sick, die. Uh, Most of the people recognized it as consumption because people would go to the medical doctor, whatever path for a a physician at that time, uh, and they would probably get diagnosed as having, you know, pulmonary tuberculosis, physicists, they called it, uh, consumption was the, the best, the most general, generally used term at that time. And so they would be diagnosed with consumption. And it, it, it's called that because it basically consumes your body. You know, your lungs were rotting, you get weaker and weaker and sicker and sicker, paler and paler. You start coughing up blood. And as time goes on, you cough up even more blood from spoonfuls to cupfuls of blood. So people would go into the room of someone who was ill and they would see blood in the corners of the mouth, blood on the bed, bed clothes, and would, it would be like, my gosh, something is literally sucking the life, the blood out of my relative. 
And medical practitioners, if they were uh, honest, would say, there's, there's really nothing I can do. So they would turn somewhere else. And it would be maybe whispered in the community by someone or maybe someone from another county would come in. There's cases of this. Come in and say, well, look, here's what they, they did over there. And uh, maybe you should try this. And then they would tell them whatever variant of the cure or ritual they knew. And so most most of the time you would go to the cemetery and exhume the bodies of the people in, that, in your family that had died from this disease. And you were looking for the one that obviously looked not so not quite dead, not decomposed. So people who were completely decomposed were eliminated as potential threats. And basically, you were looking for liquid blood in one of the vital organs. And liquid blood was interpreted as fresh blood. You know, how would fresh blood get into a, to a dead corpse? Well, obviously, it's taking it from living. And then there's variants of the ritual. The, I guess you would say the normal way to, to uh, do this would be to cut out the heart or the other organs that were fresh and burn them to ashes. Now, sometimes people who were sick would be instructed to uh, eat the ashes, either in water or some sort of medicine of some sort. Another version would be to just burn the entire corpse and sometimes have people who were sick become fumigated by the smoke or actually even breathe in the smoke. And there are a couple of cases I've found where I guess it's like trying to cover all bases. So they would cut out the heart, uh, burn it to ashes, burn the body, inhale the smoke, and then eat the ashes. So you're doing all of these things. So, so spare a thought for someone who's dying of tuberculosis and is asked to eat a tuberculosis-infected organ. Well, it's burned. Oh, well. But see, no, I mean, you have to realize that in... Uh, in folk, in folk beliefs, almost probably universal, that burning is a purification. And it's not just a purification ritual, but it, you know, it actually gets the evil out. And in, in a sense, that's also a logical uh, approach to things. Uh, I'm sure within the context of, of that folk belief system, it does. It's hard to process. And I... I feel like even for people back then, for a lot of folks, it was really hard to process. Uh, it was. In fact, uh, well, let's start with most of the stories that we have that I've collected are told by outsiders, the majority. Now, the outsiders often were uh, newspaper reporters or someone else that sent a, like Moses Holmes did in uh, Willington, Connecticut. He wrote a letter to the editor describing this event and saying how awful it was. And that is the usual uh, interpretation, whether it's by newspaper reporters or people who report these stories in the newspaper or by local historians who have found the uh, evidence of this, either from oral tradition, eyewitnesses, or in, in other archives. Uh, or uh, medical doctors. Quite a few medical doctors have written about this, wrote about it, in the, uh, you know, in the 1800s. And almost always, it's almost universal. It's condemnation. Mm -hmm. It's a horrible superstition, or it's a, it's a survival from an earlier stage of cultural evolution. That's the way it was interpreted later in the 19th century by the people who believe in cultural evolution. Well, these, these were practices, we're civilized now, but these were practices that were being done in the age of savagery and barbarism, lower levels of culture, and they were just brought forward into civilization, but they they're basically have no meaning, they're irrational, and we need to uh, stamp them out. So those are the at kinds of attitudes. So I say I've got more than 80 examples just basically in New England. Uh, I'm sure it happened uh, much more often. It didn't get recorded for a lot of reasons. 
when they when these cases did get recorded, often people would leave out surnames or family names or other identifying uh, indicators, whether it would be the, the place where it happened or who did it. But e- even then, it sounds like uh, the folks who were doing this practice were kind of on the edge of society. No, I would not say no, no, no. I, I, yeah, I think that's a, I think it's a, a, it's a conclusion that it's a logical conclusion to make, but it didn't, it doesn't turn out that way. Okay. Okay. One of the most interesting cases I have uh, comes from a first-person letter written by the man who was the congregational minister in Belchertown, Massachusetts, in the Connecticut River Valley for something like 56, 58 years. But pretty early in his uh, tenure as the minister, he wrote a letter to a friend of his. And in the letter he says, I was on my way to this town near where I live with my daughter and she started hemorrhaging. And he said, you can imagine I was, how alarmed I was because I've had three daughters already died of consumption and now I have two who were ill, including my daughter. Uh, her name happened to be Mercy, too. And so he said, I wondered if it was possible for the dead to be praying on the living. And so he goes on to describe how the day before he wrote this letter, he went to the nearby town of Hatfield and exhumed. Well, first he called it a, a consultation to actually address this question, is it possible for the dead to pray on the living? And he had people in town who were parts of his family, also some medical doctors. And he said, you know, they didn't really agree, but they finally relented and said, try it. And so he went to the cemetery in Hatfield and exhumed the body of his mother-in-law no mother-in-law jokes, please, (laughs) and uh, decided that she would, well, there was actually a doctor there, and they decided that she was too decomposed to be responsible. So he went back to Belchertown the next day and exhumed the uh, the body of a daughter uh, who had been married uh, not long before she died, and they decided that, yeah, there was some fresh looking parts to her. So in this case, this is an interesting variant of the ritual. They took her heart out and put it in a separate box and then reburied it about a foot above the coffin. So a congregational minister performs the ritual. Basically, he participates in it. He directs it. So it's not really marginalized. In, in, in Chesey, New York, upstate New York, I think it was 1814, another case where uh, the minister's wife was sick and dying, so they exhumed her, the body of her deceased brother and burned his heart. And in another instance, it said that half the town turned out to watch the burning on Woodstock Green, which would have been a, a couple thousand people probably. Wow. The, the story of the minister is interesting because I'd always been given to understand that the church was kind of down on this practice and both your, in Europe and in the States didn't really mm-hmm. care for it. Well, I mean, look at the Puritan church in, in the early colonial times. I mean, they weren't exactly distancing themselves from the, the witch trials. No, I, I wanted to ask you about the witch trials, but... Yeah, well... Great, crazy, different idea, but the, the idea of exhuming dead bodies yeah. was something well, that it always seemed like the church was distancing itself from. But you seem to have some, uh, you have some stories where that's just not the case, that, that go uh, against that idea. I think in the in the, the case of the vampire ritual, I think it's purely sec- secular. Justice Forward, Reverend Justice Forward of Belchertown, that was his name, he didn't, in his letter, he didn't, he didn't wonder why... This was visited on him by God, or he didn't mention any of that. He just asked, is it possible for the dead to pray on the living? Mm. So it was totally, he was not, 
he was not examining this, these events uh, from the framework of, of a religious system. It he, was took, pure, he took off his church hat medical, and put on his medical, folklore hat. Yeah, it was a medical problem yeah. of some sort. Well, you brought up the witch trials, and that's a question I've often had. Um, why were vampires blamed for these issues and not some other force, like demons or witches or something like that? Why do you, why do you think it was the dead that got the rap? Well, it, again, I have to go back to the notion that this was really a, a folk medical practice, a folk remedy. So it wasn't it wasn't viewed in the context of uh, witchcraft so much. I mean, it was the closest anybody gets is, as I said before, is like there's some sort of an evil spirit inhabiting the corpse. Mm -hmm. Now, there's that's basically where it ends in terms of you know connections t to any other belief system. It's not like whoa. Well, where did these evil spirits come from? What are they? I mean, exactly. That uh, people were not people were not getting into it like that. What they were doing was just doing what they thought they had to do to stop the deaths in the family. The the, no. the rules weren't set down too firmly. It was just no. Make me stop this. I need I need this to stop. I don't need to know all the ins and outs. Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, my mother, well, I had a wart on my knee I wanted to get rid of as a kid. And my mother was a, a fine, upstanding religious woman. <laughs> and she said, well, go next door to Thelma's house. And when she's not looking, steal a dish rag <laughs> from her cupboard and, and I'll put it, you know, where she can't see it. And then we go home, we could, you rub it the dish rag on your wart and then you bury it in the yard and your wart will go away. I'm not kidding. I have to ask, did it work? Uh, <laughs> let me look. <laughs> it keeps coming back. Ah. No, it, yeah. But, uh, no, she wasn't, I didn't, I didn't ask her. I said, well, that's, I know, I was like, I was probably 13. I didn't go like, Mom, Mom, this is crazy. I mean, how can you, you know. But she, that's, she said, well, that's what she heard when she was growing up. You, you know, to that point, when people would try these folk practices in New England where they would cut out hearts or burn hearts, once in a while, the sick people would get better, right? Sure. And so it might seem like, well, well, maybe there's something to this. Well, that's that's the way these so-called superstitions, you know, folk beliefs, pretty much work. You know, the successes are noted, and they stand out in bold, italic mm -hmm. type, if you will, in your mind. And the failures just kind of like dissolve away. And in the, the fact is that throughout most of this uh, consumption endemic, if you did nothing. Your survival rate was was about the same, probably maybe even perhaps a little better than if you went to a medical doctor, who would who would probably bleed you. Mm -hmm. Well, that makes things worse. Yeah. You know, you're already anemic because you're dying of consumption and you're losing blood. So taking more blood out is is going to make you worse. So I mean, the truth is that whether you did nothing at all, whether you went to the medical doctor, or whether you tried this ritual your chances of survival are pretty much about the same. So, why not? Someone I must mean, have put it together that medical doctors are bleeding the patients, but also the supposed revenants in the graves are bleeding the patients, too. Uh, you know, I haven't found evidence that they were, they were do, just doing that. I see, see people's diaries and they talk about getting sick and I went to Dr. Wilson and, and he opened a vein <laughs> and I felt a little better. <laughs> okay. You probably felt lightheaded. You felt high. Yeah, exactly. I can't have Michael Bell in front of me and not talk about Mercy Brown. 
Sure. Uh, can you tell me about the uh, teenage girl who was blamed for an entire family's death? Almost an uh, entire family's death? Yeah. Well, Mercy Brown lived in uh, Exeter, Rhode Island, which is southern Rhode Island, in, in the late, very late 1800s. And she, when she was uh, 19, she died in January of 1892 uh, of consumption. Uh, her mother had already died, and one of her sisters had already died of consumption. And at that time, then, she had a, a brother, Edwin, who was a, a young married man living in the town next, next door to Exeter. And he got sick. Now, he was sent to Colorado Springs to see if he could get better. Uh, it didn't work. So he and his wife came back from uh, Colorado. In the meantime, uh, Mercy Brown's father, George Brown, was uh, besieged by neighbors and kin, people in the community, who were afraid that if, it, if he didn't take care of it, it was just going to keep spreading. And they wanted him to try this, what they called the old remedy. Uh, he said, I don't have faith in this. The local newspapers report him saying that he didn't believe that this was going to be uh, a viable cure, but to satisfy his kin and his neighbors, he asked the medical doctor from uh, that area, the medical examiner, uh, Dr. George Metcalf, he asked him if he would come to the cemetery and oversee an exhumation. Well, Metcalf said, you know, this is nonsense, but to satisfy the family, I will come there because he was the doctor and he was also the medical examiner. So uh, in March, it was March 17th, 1892, uh, according to the newspapers, they exhumed the body of Mercy's mother and Mercy's sister. Uh, they were found to be pretty much all decomposed. I think one of them might have been a skeleton with some hair on the on the top. And then they went to the above ground crypt, which where was where Mercy was. She had died in January. Well, in those days, the the, the ground was frozen, mm -hmm. probably until March or you know early April. And so she was waiting for the ground to defrost so that she could be interred. So they took her out of, actually out of the crypt. Well, of course, she'd been dead for, what, January, February, three months in the winter. No embalming in those days, at least not by the, the folks in the, in, the, in the country. And so she's going to look fresh, and she did look fresh. Uh, Dr. Metcalf apparently performed the autopsy, which was to open up and look at the heart. He said later in the newspaper that account that uh, there was nothing unusual about her appearance, you know, given what I just said. Uh, but the people, the attendants, the ones who wanted this done, proclaimed that she, that she had fresh blood in her heart. So according to the newspapers, her heart and I think her liver were both removed and burned on a, burned on a rock nearby to ashes. And then... The ashes were supposed to have been consumed by Edwin. Uh, nobody knows whether that actually happened or not. Uh, in any event, uh, Edwin died two months later, which is sad. But I got the story from, first I heard it from a descendant of the Brown family who heard it from people who were actually around at the time this happened, because they'd be going to the cemetery on Children's Day or Memorial Day in June, May, and they'd be playing around the cemetery when they're decorating graves. And, and the older relatives say, well, don't go over there and touch this stone because it's an awful thing that took place years ago. And then they would tell the story of, of Mercy Brown. Now, according to the family story, uh, 
after Edwin died, no one else in the family died, so that took care of the problem. So you can see how you can interpret, you know, okay, one more died, one more, he was too far gone. He was too far gone, yeah. Everybody well, else was spared. It, it seems like there was a lot of trouble to go to if they didn't have Edwin breathe in the fumes or drink the ashes or something. Well, you know, in, in many cases, oh, that's where it stopped, the burning. And that, that's where the ritual was, was, was stopped. That's, so it, because it's a folk practice, you'll find variations on how it's done. It's, it seems to be an important distinction, though, because one seems to be, if all we do is burn it, sure. it's like we're getting rid of an evil spirit. Right, but, but we're if not... We're, if we're ingesting it, then there's some sort of healing. folk medicine yeah. that comes that's from a, the body. That's the next step, which I would call you know, healing. Yeah. You know, burning, you're burning you, like you say, you're destroying the evil thing. But then the healing part is consuming the ashes or inhaling the smoke. I, I would guess that someone who uh, believes you're destroying an evil spirit would be aghast that somebody else, three communities over, would be then eating the ashes of whatever evil spirit they just sure. disposed of. They must have thought that was a, a radical way to do it. Well, if they found out about it, yeah. Or they might they might try it next time, saying, well, I mean, those, that's, the way folk, that's the way the folk process that's works. That's what we've been missing this whole time. People, uh, you know, people don't adopt things just for the sake of change or novelty. But sure. uh, they will, people will adopt new things if it seems to work or make sense in some way. So, I mean, folklore is not static. It's always changing. It's the process that, that that's creative and imaginative, just like other kinds of uh, human culture pro cultural processes. Now, in, in parts of Maine, they were really practical. I mean, all they did was turn the corpse upside down and rebury it. Oh, that seems really easy by comparison. You know, that's, that's uh, a lot less bother. One other thing I wanted to ask you about Mercy Brown, it's often cited as the last American vampire, mm -hmm. but was she really the last case we have of a uh, vampire exhumation in the United States? No. <laughs> and again, we'll get back to your definition of a vampire. What do you call a vampire? Uh, there was a case in 1922, Winona. Minnesota. Oh. You know where Winona is? I do. I did not know there was a case in Winona. Yeah. I, go back and look at the papers from, I can give you the reference. Uh, I think it was 1922, maybe 24, I think 22. And a, a man who lived in an immigrant community in Winona. Anyway, the Polish community uh, told him he should go to the cemetery and do some things because I think he had something like six or seven sons and there was only one still alive and he was sick and dying of consumption. So he went to the cemetery and he, for some reason he picked a daughter and a son, two, two bodies to, to exhume. And he was going to take their heads off and put them down at the foot of the coffin maybe between their feet or their knees, and then and rebury them. But when, after he had exhumed them, he decided that they were, they were too decomposed, and I guess they weren't fresh enough for this to work, so he reburied them. Well, the word got out that this happened, and there was a, a huge to-do, and I followed it in the papers for, for days and days, weeks, actually. You know, where the poor man was badgered and harassed and, you know, uh, people said, well, Attorney General ought to do something about this. And the Attorney General says, it's not against the law to exhume one of your family members' corpses. <laughs> so it's a fascinating uh, story, but that's not the last one. There was one in 1949 in the mountains of uh, Pennsylvania. And, you know, in a community that was settled by uh, <clears throat> Germans in the late 1700s. And 
a young man named uh, Reuben Rock had gone to uh, the war in World War II and served in North Africa and Italy. He came back with tuberculosis. And his wife, Rosella, uh, tended to him, tried to do everything she could. And, uh, but he, he passed away, I think, in 1948. And after that, she started complaining that she was wasting away. And there was also poltergeist activities mm-hmm. in the house and, and noises. Things would move and shift, and there were noises and stuff. So she finally got some advice from a, a spiritual advisor who said, uh, you know, Ruben is still active. He's not departed. And so they got permission to go to the cemetery and exhume his body. And what they did in this case is they sprinkled it with salt uh, and then wrapped him in a clean blanket and reburied him. And she said after that, that uh, she had she had no more problems and she started re- recovering. It's a much gentler way to handle uh, yes. the spirit from the grave. <clears throat> As I said, these are all folk practices, so they exist in variation, you know, from community to community, whether it's a, a geographical community like New England versus, say, Minnesota, or whether it's a, an ethnic community, say, the Polish versus the German-American or the colonial background in Yankee. Still, that's 1949. That's, that's not very long ago. No, it's not. I mean, no. I mean, World War II was over. The Depression was over. This... This was not long ago. Right. Wow. Well, you know, I've done, I, doing the research for that, I found that uh, Ruben's widow uh, uh, died in 1979. So it's like, and it's interesting, her obituary does not mention at all any of this. In fact, it doesn't even mention that she, that she had been married. Oh, interesting. And she became a missionary after that, actually, and devoted her life to helping people spiritually. Uh, ho- hopefully help- helping living people spiritually and, and not banishing evil spirits with salt. Right. Why do you think it is, this, despite the availability of facts to the contrary, we can't help but make certain people vampires, whether it's Nellie Vaughn or Seaman James Brown or even Vlad the Impaler? We, we just can't let go of that idea that this person may have been a vampire. Well, I mean, the whole vampire I- idea is, is a very attractive idea. It's repulsive and attractive at the same time. And in fact, just that aspect of it being two sides of one same coin makes it appealing, too. I mean, we are attracted to being repulsed, mm-hmm. <laughs> obviously, of our horror movies and and horror and gothic novels just wouldn't exist. So it's our love, of, you know, the one folklorist called it the uh, the chill of fright. <laughs> we like to have our hair stand on in. Ooh, it's scary. I mean, it gets our adrenaline going. But with most of the vampires, it's, it's a safe way to be frightened mm-hmm. because down, we know they're not real. It didn't, they're not true. Or are they? For some that, people, that might that, not well, be the case. Another aspect that makes it very attractive. Mm-hmm. It's also not on the cusp of being repulsive and, and attractive at the same time. It's also on the cusp of being believable or unbelievable. It's in that gray area. And that's where, that's where legends exist. That's the territorial legends. You know, did it happen? Could it have happened? No. Yes. The dialectic of a legend, is, as one folklorist called it. What what eventually ended the American vampire panic, if if it really did end? Uh, well, uh, several things kind of coalesced. Uh, one, in 1882, uh, Edward Cook, who was a German medical doctor and scientist, uh, announced that he'd discovered the tuberculosis bacterium. So right there, there was a cause. Now, that wasn't universally accepted all at once. I think the New York Times read a, ran an editorial saying, cause, because someone said, suggested we might be able to use this as for an inoculation to prevent tuberculosis, 
the time said, oh yeah, and what are you going to, we're going to next, we're going to inoculate our trousers so we don't get broken legs. So it wasn't like everybody was on board right from the beginning all at once. It took a while for that idea to sink in. And also it wasn't until what, 1941, 42, that we had streptomycin, which was an effective antibiotic that actually could treat tuberculosis. Until that time, there was no, nothing that could really cure it. They would isolate people, put them in sanitariums and so on. Uh, they, they, they knew enough to do that because they knew it was contagious. Now they knew why it was contagious. It wasn't that death was contagious, but it was that microscopic uh, bacterium with fangs that was killing people. I remember reading that passage in your book about the, the people asking about inoculating their trousers. And it was the first time I kind of said, yeah, vaccines must have seemed really strange the first time anyone ever brought them up. Sort of. But people had been vaccinating themselves uh, with smallpox, you know, even before the Revolutionary War. I mean, the Surgeon General at that time during the Revolutionary War was, was advising his soldiers, in fact, maybe even demanding that they do this. Because I knew if I took a little bit of it, I didn't um, know that. I get mild, mild, mildly sick, but then you will be, you will have immunity. Now they didn't, didn't really understand the whole process involved. They just knew that it worked. So it wasn't a new idea. But that's interesting. I, I never heard that about smallpox during the revolution that people yeah. were practicing that. Yeah, it's it's an interesting story. And then another thing that happened, not just the discovery of the germ. Uh, was that embalming started to become more and more of the social thing to do. You know, it started actually during the Civil War. And I think having Lincoln's uh, body go from Washington, D.C. to Springfield, Illinois, on a train when people could actually view his body because he was so uh, beloved, uh, that it just kind of the idea of embalming started to become the socially accepted thing to do. So... By the late uh, 1900s, uh, 1800s, when people are, more and more people are embalming their dead, you know, their dead, they're not going to come back. It, it does change the uh, chemical composition of a vampire if uh, they're full of formaldehyde. Uh, I had a question from somebody online. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Evil Little Luca on Amino wanted to know specifically about the Highgate scare in uh, England in the 1970s. Okay. And wondered if there's a connection. Was there something similar going on with the mob mentality there, uh, similar to what was going on in New England? Uh, no, I don't. I, I wouldn't connect the two. And in fact, I mean, there are a lot of people who think the whole Highgate scare was basically a hoax. But I, I can refer you to people that will tell you all about it if you want. Well, uh, and there, there's people who will sue you if you say that too. I mean, there's a, there's a, there are groups of people that are, uh, you know, tooth and nail at each other over Highgate. Well, I guess, I guess maybe the question behind the question is, uh, just regardless of what caused the Highgate scare, was some of the mob mentality behind it similar to what may have been happening in the communities in New England? Uh, yeah, but it, to me, it was more of a... It wasn't a, f a fear of the dead so much. Mm -hmm. It's a fear of disease and death. And then the last resort, that maybe this will work. Right. And I don't think the people who were doing this were making too much of an explicit connection between the, their dead family member and the disease. As I said, it was something evil inside of it, the corpse. So well, it's been a panic, but to me that that implies something that was just much more uh, widespread and immediate. You know, everybody's like, ah, oh, panic. Mm -hmm. it, it, this was a slow, I mean, because of the consumption itself was endemic. So it was just in the community, of, and it would rise and fall and rise and fall. And the same with the people who had had it. Some of them would seem to get better, and then they would relapse and seem to get better, and then relapse even further. And 
get a little better and then get further down. And sometimes it would take years or even decades for a person to die of consumption. So to say panic, it just makes it seem like it's almost like it's more like the COVID-19 where you know, it's a pretty, that's a, seems to be a, you know, fairly fast burning or smallpox, which is a very fast burning disease. There could be panic, there were panics around smallpox and yellow fever and diphtheria and those things. But consumption. I, I've been using the word panic uh, in reference to what happened in New England. What 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 term could we use instead? Uh, just the, I guess, just the fear of consumption. The consumption, you know, what would you call it? That doesn't sell newspapers as well as no, vampire I panic. Know. I know. You had a you had a good line about how the, the folk medicine was as much of uh, a cure for the community as it was for the individual who had the disease. Um, you said folk medicine is successful because it treats the community along with the patient, and not just the individual. Yeah, exactly. The pra the practitioner must reunite and heal the broken community. So these rituals yeah. might be less for the dead and more for the community, sort of like a, a funeral is for the oh, living yeah. uh, more than it is for the dead. Exactly. Well, well, anthropologists would call the vampire exhumation ritual a, a double obsequy. So it would be a secondary funeral or secondary funeral ritual, death ritual, okay? And you're right, the death rituals tend to be for the living. Mm -hmm. Although... We often, I, we often say this is for these, or for you know, for the benefit of the person who's deceased. Well, okay, but they're, you know, the cultural functions and social uses basically uh, uh, benefit the living. Just performing a ritual in itself is efficacious. That's Just a good point. The performance itself, apart from, you know, what it's supposed to mean or who the performers are or what the relationship is and what their roles are in the ritual, just performing a ritual itself is efficacious. Sometimes when we, you, we, we like to poo-poo ritual and say, oh, that's just a bunch of window dressing, but the, the, the act of doing it sure. has its own merit. Sure. Uh, let, me, let me bounce subjects uh, completely for a moment here um, to another question someone else asked. I dream a dream from Amina. I wanted to ask why? Why are we so much more familiar with the witch hunts that took place in New England than we are with this long simmering vampire mm -hmm. fear? Yeah, at the time of the uh, the witch trials, late 1600s. Uh, I mean, they made they made immediate news. It was it was a big news. You know, they weren't. There were tr there were public trials. There were public executions. Uh, and so it wasn't something that was just done, by, you know, in families, by families. I'm not going to say clandestinely, but people weren't making a big deal out of it for the most part. Uh, and also uh, the witch trials existed in the context of, of official culture, official religion. You know? mm -hmm. So that also gave it the stamp of of uh, of authority, and also, and that meant it also became promulgated. People knew about it. People were involved in discussing it. Uh, that's not what happened with the with the consumption ritual, with the vampire practice. You know, it was a, it was an individual thing. It was a family thing, or at most a, a community a community thing. And so, and it wasn't, there wasn't, any, there weren't connections between this community's consumption problem and another community's consumption problem and so on. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. it, were, it were folk rituals, folk practices. But today, if you mention the witch trials to anybody, mm -hmm. people will have a, an understanding of what you're talking about. Right. But if you bring up the, the vampire scare, or the, the vampire rituals, I think most Americans will, will scratch their head and say, I, I didn't know that happened here. Right. True. Why, why, do you think, why do you think everybody knows about the witch trials and not the vampire rituals? I don't know. Not enough people have read my book, I guess. No, not enough people have read your book. <laughs> I'm you need serious. to fix that. 
to be serious, though, uh, you know, newspapers would write about it. It would be sensational news for, you know, a week or something. And then the same newspaper, I'm not kidding, would have an amnesia about it. And then six years later, they might publish another story about this happening somewhere and totally not recall that, oh, yeah, we ran a story about that like five or six years ago. I can't imagine that happening in our current media landscape. Oh, no, no. One guy who wrote some histories of upstate New York said, you know, I've, I've got three, at least three cases of, of vampire activities in Franklin and Lawrence counties here. But for, for the sake of your for the sake of good taste, I'm not going to I'm not going to talk about them in the book. I've got, oh. I shame. wanted to get I wanted to find Franklin Benjamin Huff and go. But he's dead. <laughs> There was something else you said in in your book, Food for the Dead, that struck me, and I hope I, I hope I interpreted this correctly. Uh, you you noted that vampire scares were tracking with consumption, but you also pointed out that industrialization was mm-hmm. going on around the same time. What role do you think industrialization may have been playing? Was was there some sort of revolt against modernity? 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 Against uh, the the current world, I, since I can't say the word modernity. Well, I, I, you know, I think it did in terms of tuberculosis. It, it, it certainly had an impact because it was bringing people. It was like the meatpacking plants now in the in the coronavirus. Mm-hmm. You know, you were bringing people all together, crammed in these, you know, uh, close quarters, probably very little ventilation and so on. So uh, tuberculosis. Uh, consumption uh, took its toll. Uh, and the Industrial Revolution started in, in this country, and actually at Slatersville, Rhode Island, you know, I think it was 1792. It may be no accident that the epicenter of the Industrial Revolution was right next to the epicenter of the right. vampire scare in America. Exactly. I think there's definitely a correlation. And that's why the Northeast was harder hit with uh, tuberculosis than other parts other parts of the country. Sure, they had their problems, but it wasn't as, as intense. I mean, the people have written uh, maybe, as one out, maybe as many as one out of every four deaths in the Northeast during this time, during the 19th, uh, 19th century, uh, caused by uh, tuberculosis. I mean, that's, that's a, a staggering number. You noted that vampire stakings and decapitations goes back much, much farther, than, even than the colonization of America. Mm-hmm. Um, do you see a, a common point of origin for what was going on in Eastern Europe and what was happening in America somewhere way far back in history? As I said before, I, I think the, the case from Willington, Connecticut in 1784 really uh, is, a, is a great clue the foreign quack doctor, mm-hmm. and that's why I think we don't have evidence of this, you know, prior to the Revolutionary War in in our country. Uh, for one thing, I don't think the consumption uh, endemic wasn't really a, on, uh, that bad at that time. It, it just got worse, and so you know, if the disease isn't there, you don't need the cure. And uh, so, but I, I think the connection is really, it's not a deep cultural connection at all. It's more of a surface connection in terms of. Unless okay. anyone think you're just blaming a foreigner because they're a foreigner. <laughs> uh, uh, well, you, you, know, you noted that the, the, the residents of that area were mostly descended from England from which there was no similar belief system to this at all. Right. So they couldn't have brought it with them. I no. I you know. I I've looked at the folklore, the folk beliefs in, surrounding things like consumption or any other disease, and I I just don't find evidence of this happening in in Great Britain anywhere. And, and I think you also noted that you couldn't find anything uh, that would have come from the native population would not have informed the the new like new colonizers of this well that was also a theory that was presented by the 
the Providence Journal when they reported on the Mercy Brown event in 1892. One of their theories was, well, maybe it came from, you know, the Indians. Mm-hmm. Well, of course, are they going to, you know, somebody else said, well, it must be a, it must be a, a, a black tradition. Maybe it came from the slaves. You know, you're always going to find the scapegoats. Sure. And, you know, the, the native, the indigenous people and the and African Americans uh, were scapegoats. But, but you actually have uh, the receipts that show that this may have been from a traveling doctor. Occasionally, you, you hear these uh, explanations for vampirism will circulate. People will uh, uh, talk about porphyria or rabies or some other, or, or live burial. How do you respond when someone brings one of those up? First of all, people that have, you know, lupus disease or porphyria, whatever, uh, they don't, they're not really happy with the idea that, you know, maybe they're responsible for the vampire belief. I don't think so. <laughs> I don't blame them. Uh, but the, the fact is, in Europe, uh, it wasn't just tuberculosis or consumption that vampires spread. It was uh, any unexplained number of deaths in the village, in the community. Then they would go to the cemetery sometimes and exhume the bodies looking for who might be responsible. So it was a much wider net in terms of uh, what was what was plaguing the population. It wasn't just tuberculosis. It could have been any, even, even a number of uh, unfortuitous weird accidents might be blamed on a vampire in that sense it's in in europe it was more akin to to the idea of a witch right that of a witch casting a spell on you or a curse and causing your problems in this case it was you know a dead corpse it was the vampire it was not quite dead that was causing the problems i mean they're diff- they're separate they're separate folkloric um, monsters, although there's a, in folklore a lot of the same attributes get attached to different species. Brina Belladonna and Amina wants to know when your new book is going to be coming out. I I wish I knew. It's uh, <laughs> basically it's, it's done. I've I've been working with an editor, and uh, it's all the edits have been put in place. So now we're just waiting for the publisher. So well. I hope it's soon because uh, I'm thirsty for more good vampire folklore and uh, nonfiction about vampires. Oh, thanks. Well, I feel like if there's one takeaway from all of this today, it's that we should try to not stay in enclosed spaces with other people who are infected. We should try to spread out. Uh, We should wait for some sort of cure or inoculation whether it is uh, a vampire epidemic or tuberculosis or COVID-19. Is that a fair takeaway from all of this? Sure. (laughs) All right. Just, you know, be safe. That's the, be safe, be healthy, uh, be smart. And don't dig up your dead relatives. No, not yet, please. Not yet. Let's wait (laughs) wait as long as we can. Do you think we're going to come to that? I said, I hope not. I hope not either. Well, Dr. Michael Bell, thank you so much. This has been really exciting to finally uh, get to meet you and ask you so many questions about uh, your book and about the American Vampire Panic. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Wow. What an honor to finally talk to Michael Bell about his work in vampire folklore. Take a look at some of his work. Food for the Dead is a must read if you are interested in vampire folklore and the vampire practices and the vampire scare that took place in the United States. Uh, His upcoming book, Vampire's Grasp, not out yet, but uh, take a look at the websites down below. It'll keep you up to date. I'm going to keep uh, links to several different places where you can follow up on Michael Bell's work, and uh, I hope you do. This guy is a key writer when it comes to vampire nonfiction. Remember the takeaways we have here. Distance. Don't believe every new folk remedy that comes along. And for God's sakes, don't dig up your relatives. 